Good evening. All right, good evening. Good evening. <laughs> How is everyone? Wonderful. Must be losing my mind. Lunch, Lunch was good. Lunch was good. <laughs> That's our NAC. I'm glad. Because they've given up just about these months. People being good to them, bless their hearts. But uh, we're glad that you're here. Good to see you today. I hope you have a good week. I am losing my mind. I'm trying to put this clip on my belt on the wrong side. All right. We can get started now. I'm dressed. <laughs> we have been studying. Oh, by the way, before I forget, uh, next Sunday night is singing night. So come well pitched, well tuned, well oiled, well greased. Just come ready to sing. That's what we'll do the first Sunday of the month for the quarter. So we'll have singing. <clears throat> We've been studying on Sunday nights. This will conclude our series of month of March on prayer, We're trying to tie it in. We wanted to kick off our prayer ministry. And so we wanted to to, to talk about, to spend a little time in prayer. It's, not, it's nothing that you don't know. Tonight is definitely nothing that you don't already know and haven't heard and thought about several times in your life. But I want you to to just rethink it because uh, we're prone to forget and it's good to be reminded from time to time. There's outside of a monastery by the name of St. Catherine's, there is uh, two burial plots and they're actually of two monks that uh, passed away 12 centuries ago. They vowed as youth to pray and to pray for individuals. And so in keeping that vow, they literally chained themselves together so as to be reminded of their vow that they had made together. They lived in this monastery with a wall in between them, and the, the chain literally went through the wall from one to the other. And they're buried side by side as folks that were reminded and should be reminded of the fact that we should pray. And we should pray for others. But exactly who should we pray for? That's always the question. We know the Bible tells us to pray. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing, that men ought always pray not to faint. Uh, we're, Paul said in Romans 12, be instant in, in prayer. And we know that, that prayer is a part of our life, and, and it is. It's usually a greater part of our life when we're going through difficulties and going through problems. But the Bible doesn't just address the idea of we can take our problems, we can take our difficulties, we can take our, our heartaches, our hurts, our disappointments, our discouragements, our anxieties. We can take that to, and lay it before the feet of God. But it also talks about that we should spend time in our prayers praying for people, praying for others. But we, we come back to the question, well, who should we pray for? Well, I want you to take your hand. Hold it up. This is an old restoration movement. I want you to hold it as if it were kind of sideways, maybe almost like you're praying with your thumb pointed towards you. And this is going to remind you of how and who to pray for. This is important. It's not just because, you know, we have a prayer ministry and we're going to be asking you to pray for specific people for three weeks and then we'll switch up the list. But it's also just a simple reminder of day by day. Somewhere in your prayer life, and I'm sure you offer up several prayers a day, but somewhere in that prayer life, there are others besides yourself and besides the whole that's going on in your life that needs praying for. So do you pray for? Well, we're going to let the thumb, since we're holding our hand this way, the thumb represents those that are closest to us. Well, who's Who are those that are closest to us? Well, we, first of all, we have our families, right? We, we love our, our spouses, our children, our grandchildren. We, we love our, our aunts and uncles. We love our cousins. Well, you know, some of them we tolerate. But, you know, we, 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 we like those people. We love those people. Those are the people that are closest to us. Family. You know, Manoah, when Samson was promised in the book of Judges, the 11th chapter, do you remember what Manoah did? He prayed. And when I read, read that uh, scripture there, the only thing I think about is, here's what he asked for. God, send us an instruction manual with this child. 
<laughs> and I think about how many parents, you know, often think about, Lord, send, send us a, an instruction manual with this child. But, but yet you have Noah oh, praying for his children. You have Hannah praying to have a child in First Samuel, the first chapter. And the second chapter is, well, the second chapter is a prayer of thanksgiving. But you have Hannah praying for a child. You have David praying for a sick child in Second Samuel chapter 12 and praying that the child might live. And, it, of course, sadly it doesn't. But we should pray, and we should pray for those that are closest to us, and that by all means includes our physical family. Pray for, for your, your spouse. Pray for them and for their well-being and for what goes on in their life. Pray for uh, your, your parents uh, if they're not passed away. If they have, of course, we, we, we pray a prayer of thanksgiving for them and for what they did for us. Pray aunts and uncles, especially if they're going through difficult times and, and uh, situations. Pray for your, your siblings, your brothers, your sisters. I have one sister, love her dearly. Uh, we're close enough. <laughs> she, she's over there. No, we, but uh, love her dearly. She, she means a lot to me, always has my whole life, even when we fussed and fought. And we did that. But uh, love her dearly. And so pray for my sister. I pray for my brother-in-law. love my brother-in-law. I pray for him that he might have patience with my sister. <laughs> but, but pray for your brother-in-law. Pray for your family, but not just your physical family. You know, the church is your spiritual family, right? The the word is actually used several times. It's the word household. It's translated household in the New King James Version. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And others talk about uh, the household of God. When we think of household, at least I do, I think of the people that are in it. And we don't necessarily think of, of a family because that can include servants and workers and so forth and so on. But the word that's used there, Paul talks about, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. The household. Paul talks to Timothy and he says that you may know how to behave yourselves in the household of God. It's the idea of a family. Jesus even said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 49, he says that whoever does the will of my father, the same as my brother and sister. Well, actually he starts off mother and brother and sister. We're a family. River Road is a family, family of God. And we should pray for, for members within family. I was reading today, or no, excuse me, I was reading yesterday, I believe it was, an article, the new president for Harding University, he's actually at Faulkner right now, and he won't take over at Harding until June. But he had asked for a list of every student at Harding. Now, you got to understand, there's about 5,000 students. And he said he delivered this address to the Harding campus, I believe mid-January. He made the statement, he said, between now and the time I start, he said, I am going to lift up each one of your names to God in prayer. And I, I was just really touched by that because he said, I'm going to do it and my wife's going to do it. And then he, he encouraged them if they had anything going on that maybe they wanted included in that prayer that he they would could email it or, or text him and he would lift that up as well. Well, that holds true with the family of God. We're family. We hurt together, we cry together, we rejoice together, we, we love each other, we spend time with one another, we're concerned about one another, not just their physical well-being, but their spiritual well-being as well. And so we pray for our spiritual family. But then if you look at the, the next hand, the, the four, what's called by some, the forefinger, the hand, and we're going to pray for those who point the way because it's often what we do with that finger. Well, who's the, who are the ones that point our way in our congregation? Well, the elders. The elders. The elders, I always hold a, a special place in my heart. My father served, as I've told you before, my father served as an elder for many, many years and was taught growing up 
to love and respect and to honor elders. Don't always agree with elders. I'll just tell you now, I don't always agree with elders. I did agree with them in my evaluation Wednesday. They said I was doing a pretty good job. I thought, I thought, well, aren't they smart? <laughs> but no, elders have a, a tremendous responsibility to shepherd the flock. First Peter chapter 5 Peter talks about that he was a shepherd of the flock as well, but he said that they're to shepherd the flock, take heed. Paul would tell the church at Ephesus as he bid farewell to the church, but he called in the elders, remember? And he said that they were to take heed to the flock and feed the flock over which the Holy Spirit's made you overseers. They shepherd the flock. Well, what does a shepherd do? A shepherd leads, a shepherd guides, a shepherd makes sure that the, the sheep are, are fed, that they're watered, that they're also taken care of. That's what a shepherd does. That's what a, our elders try to do, try their very best to do. And so we, we really need to pray for our elders to, to carry them before the very throne of God and say, look, you know, they're doing the best they can, and, and they've got all of us, and, but they're doing the very best that they can and help them and give them the wisdom. Eldering is not just about making decisions. It's not just about, you know, getting together. Ever how often we get together, about once a month. They, they may meet occasionally through phone or whatever. But, but sitting there <clears throat> and just saying, well, okay, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. We're going we're gonna to do this to our building. We're going to start this ministry. And we're going to start this program. And we, we, need to, we need to think about these people and these individuals and what's going on with them. And what's happening in their life? And do you know anything about this one? Or do you know anything about that one? And I do know and appreciate that we do spend a little time, a lot of times, talking about individuals and where they are spiritually and what we know that we can share. Now, admittedly, they know things that I don't know and that they can't share. I know one or two things that, that I can't share with them. But that's the responsibility of elders. Pray for our deacons. Our deacons do a wonderful job. George and Steve do a wonderful job. And we appreciate them, appreciate what they do. And the reports that they gave us last week uh, help us understand really what they do do. Because sometimes you, through the years, I've served in congregations where we had deacons. And that was it. <laughs> That's all they did. It was deacons in name only. They just, well, what do you do? I, I think the church is beginning to get away from that. You pull up a lot of websites now and you'll see their list of deacons and they, they'll talk about, you know, this one's got building and this one's got maintenance and this one's got audio and this one's got worship and this one's got this and this one's got that. And, and, and I, I think that's good because that's what they are. They are servants of God. The word deacon just simply means servant and so they, they are given the task of serving the congregation to help spread the work out. Remember, really, in Acts chapter 6, I think, and I know it doesn't call them deacons there, but there were the widows that were upset. They felt like they were being left out, and they may have been. And so they spoke up. And so there were individuals that were appointed to make sure that they were taken care of. That's what deacons do. And so we appreciate George, and we appreciate Steve. And I'll just ask you to pray for me. I, I'm not too shy to ask you to pray for me. Uh, do the best you can. As preachers, preachers have the responsibility to preach no other doctrine, First, First Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, but to preach the Word, Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. That's what preachers do. Now, if you really stop and think about what is the role and what is the responsibility of preachers, and you go back and look at the books of the Bible, books of the New Testament that were dedicated to the idea of preaching in 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus, and really it's just about preaching. It's not about counseling. It's not about uh, visiting. It's about preaching. But then you say, well, wait a minute. Are you saying that you shouldn't do those things? No. I think in many ways that goes with making sure that you preach to the congregation and you help minister to the congregation. And in many ways, that's what we should call our preachers, our ministers. That's what we do. And 
most of the ones that I associate with, probably, matter of fact, maybe all the ones that I associate with, we enjoy and appreciate the opportunities to serve. I'm, I'm like a lot of preachers. I know, uh, I remember a few years ago, David saying, don't know if you know David. David uh, I, and I were talking, and David uh, preached for years down at Wood Avenue Congregation in Florence, Alabama. He's now, well, talked to him, I hadn't talked to him in a while, but he's in Fayetteville and uh, a couple of congregations here close by in Middle Tennessee. David was talking about PowerPoint, and he was talking about, you know, he says, if that helps somebody, I'm willing to do it. You're right. You're right. If it will help somebody. You know, Paul, as a preacher, talked about in the book of Philippians, he says, if I be poured out as a drink offering, he says, I rejoice. In other words, whatever I can do, whatever I can do for you at Philippi, that's the way I feel. Whatever I can do for you, I'm willing to do. I want to do, to help encourage you, to help motivate you, to help move you along, to help get you through in discouragement and, and difficult times and times of service. That's what a preacher does. So so if we're going to pray for those that are pointing, pray for the elders and pray for the deacons and pray for the preacher. But then we, we've got to get to, to our middle finger. Well, who are we going to pray for with middle finger? Well, we're going to pray for those in high places. Pray for those that are in authority. It doesn't matter what you are politically and what those that are in office are politically. You may agree with them. You may not agree with them. And I I get it. I get it. But at the same point in time, too, Paul would write Timothy, and he would say, pray for kings and for those that are in authority. We don't have a king. What's the point? point was by Paul was telling Timothy, pray for those that are in leadership roles, especially with regards to your your government, your city government, your county government, your state government, your federal government. The Bible does not endorse a a, a, a political party. It does not does not address the idea of democracy, of socialism, of of communism or anything like that. It simply just says, pray for your leaders. And we have a responsibility to pray for those individuals. They, <laughs> a lot of them need wisdom. They need help. They need our prayers. That they'll lead us in a quiet and peaceful way. The purpose of government, according to Romans chapter 13, especially in verse 4, is for us to have peace. And we should pray for them that they would keep peace and keep order, that they should not yield or wield the the sword in vain, may even be talking about discipline. So really and truly, while maybe our government has gone beyond what Bible has told us with regards to government, government has a responsibility to keep peace for our life so that we will, will be at peace but also uh, to lead us in such a way as to maintain that peace. That's really the the purpose or should be the purpose of government. As Christians, we have the responsibility to pray for those individuals, that they do that and they do it well and they do it with wisdom and they do it with understanding, considering us all, whether we agree with them or not. And so we have the responsibility to pray for those that are in authority. And so we, we've talked about praying for those closest to us, pray, praying for our families. We've talked about those that point the way, and we've talked about those, since that's the tallest finger, the, those in high places, those in, in authority. Well, then we, we want to look at the, the next, the, the ring finger, the weakest finger. Now, you might say, oh, preacher, that's not the weakest finger. Well, uh, I, I disagree with you, but also I, I will tell you this. There are plenty of studies on the Internet that you can read, and some say that it is and some say that it isn't. So you can take the argument up with whoever you want to take it up with. We're going to use it tonight to help us to talk about the weakest members. Well, who are the weakest members? Who should we pray for? James chapter 5, verse 13 following. James begins by talking about, is any of you suffering? Let him pray. We should pray for those that are going through difficult times. Those that are in their most vulnerable state. That's when Satan really works on us. Not saying that Satan doesn't work on us all the time. That's when Satan really works on us, right? 
Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. That's when Satan came, right? Matthew chapter 4, Jesus had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and then, if you will, in walks Satan. And the first thing he does is he doesn't say, well, how you doing, old boy? Why don't we go out here, and why don't you just fall down and worship me? Now, the first thing he does is he tempts him to tar- strike the stones and turn them to bread. Why? Because he hadn't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights. He started at what would be the, considered the weakest point at that time in his life. Well, Satan works on us in our weaknesses. And there are brothers and sisters in Christ. There are neighbors for that matter. There are friends. There are folks that live across town or live across the United States or even across the other side of the world that we know of that are going through difficult times. Matter of fact, Jim was telling me this afternoon of a guy that, that I've known for a few years, stage four cancer. I did not know that. There are those that are suffering, hurt, hurting. And then verse 14, he says, what about the sick? Is any sick among you? Let him pray and call for the elders. Let him pray. We need to pray for those that are sick. We have we always have a list of folks. We have folks that are, are what we might call immediately sick. They're going through difficult times. Then we have those that, that you might classify as long-term illnesses, you know, those that, that have cancer and those that, that have problems that, that are causing them to live a life different than what they want to live. And they're suffering, they're, hard, they're, they're hurting, but they're suffering and hurting because of sickness and illness that if they didn't have, they would be going about doing their, their normal activities. James says pray for these individuals. And then James says pray for those that are sinful. James chapter 5, verse 16, verse 15 and 16. But he says in verse 16, he says that we confess our faults one to another and pray one for another that you might be healed. It's the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man that avails much. We pray for those then that are sinned. For those that have brought to our attention maybe that they've sinned against us. I think I shared with you a story of a man back several years ago that I went to visit. And and he told me, and I'll make it short since I think I've shared it with you. He told me, he said, I have tried for years to inflict injury upon your ministry. He said, I just didn't like you. And I said, what in the world? He said, well, really and truly, I really loved the preacher in front of you. And I just didn't like the way they treated him. And he left. And so I didn't like anything about what you did. But I've never done anything. No, you didn't. You've never done anything to me. But he went on to say, as we continue the conversation, he said, I want to apologize. Well, there wasn't nothing to do but pray. I did. I had not known that. It had been going on for a few years. I had not known that. Uh, I had not had anybody tell me that. He had not told me that. Of course, it might say a little bit about the, what little influence he wielded within the congregation itself. He didn't really have any. But it tells us the fact that there are sometimes folks say, look, here's what I've done to you. Here's what I've done against you. Here's, here's what I've been doing behind your back. Sometimes folks come before the congregation and say, hey, I need prayers, church. I need I need help. I need, I need prayers for forgiveness. I need the comfort, the strength, and the forgiveness that my brothers and sisters can offer me. And if we get back to that idea of spiritual family, we understand the importance of it and the love that we share. But then we're willing to pray for that individual. Because if we help convert a brother from the air of his way, we save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. If you keep reading James 5, verse 19 says. And so we could use the the, if you will, the, the ring finger, the weakest finger, to talk about to God, those who are weakest. But then we should use the pinky. This is the furthest, if, if you look at your hand, this is the furthest finger from you. We should talk about those who are the furthest from us. Well, who's that? 
First of all, that's our enemies. That's those individuals that do speak out against us. That's those individuals that, for whatever reason, don't like us. That's the, the folks that, for whatever reason, can't, can't stand us. That's the folks that, for whatever reason, we, our philosophies don't mash, match and mesh. And consequently, they don't like us, and maybe they're doing everything they can to harm us. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44, he said, you've heard it's been said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, what did he say? He said, love your enemy. Love your enemy. Pray for those. Pray for those that persecute you, those that, that treat you ill. Pray for your enemies. I'll give you a good example of that. Acts chapter 7 verse 60 Stephen is being stoned. Boy, you can't have a worse enemy than that, can you? You can't have a worse enemy than, than somebody throwing rocks at you. And they probably weren't throwing little bitty pebbles at you that you pick out up off of gravel road or out in the driveway. These were stones, large stones, more like what you'd take out of the bottom of the creek. Stephen prayed for him. Jesus prayed for his enemies as well, those that were crucifying him. We need to pray for those that are our enemies, those that we don't see eye to eye. I guarantee you if there's someone that you don't necessarily like, and, and you have to analyze, why, why don't I like them? Why can't I get along with them? You have to do that personally. But if you do, if you begin to pray for them, I, I would venture a guess to say that if you'll begin to pray for them, that you'll begin to like them. Because it's very hard to pray for somebody that you don't like. Now, mind you, we're not saying, Lord, they've done me bad. Treat them evil. That's not what we're saying either. Jesus said, love your enemies. Pray for them. But we also pray for those farthest from us. How about the lost? Jesus, while hanging upon the cross, said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Jesus said, Father, forgive these folks. They don't know what they're doing. We need to pray for the lost. I appreciate every man that stands up here, and you all do a tremendous, tremendous job praying and leading us that sit in the pew, leading our hearts and our thoughts in prayer and occasionally not every time and it doesn't have to be every time either but there are those that in their prayers will lead us to pray for the lost i'm not sure matter of fact i i would say it's not appropriate to stand up before congregation and start listing all those that have quit coming to church within the last year or two don't think that would be a good idea but in your private prayers at home, those that you know of that within the last year or two have quit coming to church that maybe could be coming to church. To pray for them. To pray for the individual that you know of three or four years ago, just quit. Quit the church. Not because of the, of the pandemic, not because of the quarantine, and, and don't come now because they're still afraid of what's in that they might catch. But I, I'm talking about those that you know have quit the Lord. They've walked away. They're, they are walking in a way that is just diametrically opposed to the Lord. They're walking. If they know the, walk, the Lord's walking this way, they're walking the other way. Pray for those individuals. Call them by name in your prayers. Ask God to be with them. But also, here's another thought. Ask God to use you to help be the one that leads them back. Now there's a thought. We often pray for those individuals and we pray, oh, they'll see the error of their way. Well, how about within that saying, Lord, if you can use me, use me. Let me be at least part of the, the instrument that gets them back. Gets them back in right relationship with you. It's all about going to heaven, isn't it? This is not a contest. It's not a contest from the standpoint of the one who runs the race the swiftest is going to win. We, all, we think of 
raised us in that way, and we think of life in that way. Suzanne and I, this morning, we were talking about, before, as we were getting ready for church, we were talking about as a society. We were not talking about River Road. We were talking about as a society. As a society, we have found it a whole lot easier to criticize people than we have to praise people. Now, I have a theory. Theories are not meant to be, to be right. They are meant to be proven. But my theory is this. One of the major reasons why we as a society have found it easier to criticize people instead of praising people is because if we praise people, that puts them on a level that is either equal to us or greater than us in our minds. And if we criticize them, what does that do? That brings them down to a level lower than us because they're not near as good as we are. Now, I say it's a theory, it's, it's not, and it's not proven. But if we would quit that idea of, well, that, that makes them better or that improves them, if, if it'll help them get to heaven and if it'll help you get to heaven, it's all worth it. That's all we're about is getting to heaven. And once we lose sight of that, we've lost sight of the big picture of what Christianity is all about. And yeah, I've been with a lot through the years, and you have too, that have lost sight of that. And they've said and done things to, to me, to you, to others that they should not have. But we should still pray for them, that maybe they'll act better next time, and that they'll do right by others. We need to pray for those folks. As I grow older, I realize how important prayer is. We started out this whole series by talking about the Christian toolbox. And in the Christian toolbox, the greatest tool we have is prayer. As we pray, may we ever use that tool for God's glory, for God's good. But may we ever use it in such a way that God is lifted up and is praised. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day. We're thankful for the blessing of it. We're thankful for the opportunity that we have to petition you in prayer. We're so thankful for the, the new prayer ministry that we have. And we realize that, that we are all pushed time and and things going on, but we can always stop and especially remember people that are important to us and those that are even furthest away from us. That we can spend time talking to you about what we know with regards to their needs, their heartaches, and their hurts. So, Lord, what we ask this evening is not so much a prayer for them, but a prayer for us. That we can be your instrument Yea, even through the wonderful power of prayer to help others, to help them build their relationships with others, to build their relationships with you, to help them better our lives, to help them be individuals that they should be and that we should be as well. We ask that you watch over us, that you bless us, and keep us. And that as we hold to you, that you hold to us. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. The Lord has blessed us and blessed us with the opportunity to pray. And it's a great, great blessing. It's a great tool. I had a wonderful individual that receives our bulletins, does not come to River Road, but receives our bulletins, that sent me a, a note, a text, actually, Friday, I believe. And they commended the, the bulletin, the articles on prayer, and they made this statement. They said, I'm afraid, though, my prayers are often too selfish. Here's my answer, not bragging about it, but I just want you to spend time thinking about it. My prayer or my answer to this individual was, 
I'm sure your prayers are just what God wants. You keep praying because God wants to hear from you. This evening, if you need to come, won't you come? Come on together, we stand and sing.